Welcome to this con uh, session on how to run faster in SAS. And I'm Barter uh, up there. And I'm one of the application architects in Vincent's team, if you saw the keynote. Hello, and my name is Alexander Malafeev, and I'm engineer in the server team. And uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Henrik, and I'm the uh, one of the um, engineering managers in our application team. So in this session, we're going to look at some of the differences that are between running on-prem and in Azure. Um, because we have a lot of partners asking us, what, are, what is Business Central running on? Because to you, it's a black box. It's just a service. And we'll try to uncover what's in there and to demystify it. But it will also help you to leverage the powers of the Azure cloud. So wh when you talk about cloud, we usually see, see stupid pictures like this one, right? Or some other thing where that shows a cloud. But in reality, it looks something like this. This is in Dublin. Uh, it's a huge data center, a mile across, as you can see on the <coughs> drawing. And we have, I don't know, dozens of these around the world. If we look inside, it's obviously a bunch of machines with physical machines, and each mach physical machine will contain a number of virtual machines, obviously. And they're all based on mainstream Xeon and AMD Epic multi-core CPUs. And nothing of this so far is secret or hidden because there's documentation uh, on Microsoft Docs. Just go there and Google it or Bing it. And you can see that um, we generally run on you know, two, two point something gigahertz, 2.3, th this kind of hardware. So that's the machinery part of it. Uh, and for the time being, I mean, we experiment uh, in our cloud, but currently we run approximately four cores on our NSTs and 14 to 16 gigabytes memory. So that's one of those configurations you can see there. Same thing for SQL. Um, again, you can go and look it up on t in the docs. We use what's called elastic pools, where we buy a certain amount of resources, uh, CPUs and so on, and then we can place a number of customer databases within that elastic pool. So it's more a pr that part of it, I mean, the elastic part of it is more a pricing thing than a physical thing. Again, it's no secret, you can Google it, uh, look up in documents, and there are three <coughs> tiers, three different s types of hardware. The cheaper ones run on regular hard disks, and the more, most expensive one on the right, premium, runs on SSD disks. And the main difference between them is the latency, obviously due to the disks, and, and also the power of the machines. So when we run customer production custom, um, tenants, we use the P, uh, the, the one that's marked as P for premium and production. Uh, if you have a sandbox uh, or a trial sign up, we generally use the, the other one, the standard configuration, because obviously there's a cost to the premium compared to the others. Again, look it up if you're, if you're interested. Um, and how many databases do we pack on so in such an elastic pool? It depends. It can be one if it's a huge customer, or it can be a hundred if there are a lot of trials that are not used. Depends. This is uh, an overview of, of all the services that we use to run our services, and obviously we don't care about this because this is just technical. So we're trying to line up what do you care about? I mean, I'm, I and Hendrik, we are application developers, so we are actually technically one of you, except employed in Microsoft. And we care about this. So you have a customer or users up there who access our client. The client talks to uh, a balancer or a gateway that then routes the requests to 
uh, one NST. And you can see we have a service fabric cluster, as it's called, that where we uh, can have between five and eight currently NSTs running. So in all of each of those NSTs, think of them as a VM with four cores for the time being. And by the way, you can do the same at your, yourself if you want to. Uh, and notice also that the NST talks to a database that again has two replicas. Uh, if you saw the keynote just before, Vincent showed one replica, but it's actually two replicas. And you should also notice that even though there are free NSTs up there, I mean, let's say that this customer is the first one who logs on, we route them to the same NST because then they can share the cache. It becomes more efficient that way, unless there are too many users. And this is how things look right now, because this is something we change over time as we learn more and get different loads. And another customer would then obviously uh, be routed to a different NST and have its own database. And that all those databases are for invoicing purposes or for resource management purposes uh, parked in a pool so-called elastic pool. Um, another thing to notice is that these machines are placed s separately, obviously, and there's approximately, I mean, this is not a guarantee, but in the order of magnitude is approximately one millisecond latency between an NST machine and a SQL machine. This is something that's important <coughs> later. Another thing that's important to notice is that if a user, so if you look up the user up there, they make a change, a delta, that will of course be sent to the databases. So now we write to the database and it has to be replicated to our mirrors. That means that commits, so when we commit a transaction, obviously all three databases need to report back, yes, I'm done. That means that the commit statement that we know in AL is actually quite expensive. Well, expensive meaning microseconds, but it's more expensive than it used to be because we need to have this uh, two-phase commits between the databases. The other thing that Vincent also noticed, uh, mentioned, and Alex will talk about later, or I will, one of us will talk about later, is that those mirror databases, currently they're just there in case something goes wrong with the uh, primary database. And that's like a waste of resources because it, each of them is actually a full SQL server. So wh why not route, you know, read-only requests like report running and su such um, API calls and OData and whatnot mm -hmm. to that. So more about that later. Now how many tenants do we then pack on one of these clusters? Um, and in short, it depends because, um, how, I mean, how many, how many users do they have and how much work do they do and what do they do? So what we do is we monitor these. We um, have a lot of telemetry and we have graphs and sorts and Alex will show a lot of these uh, in a second couple of minutes and it's also something we con constantly work on. Then if we dig even deeper into when we look at what happens when we actually run our AO code. So I've tried to do some measurements and these are not scientific I would say but this, this measurement is done on a cheap four core machine, actually two core with hyperthreading, uh, two gigahertz, so it's very similar to the VMs we were running with. And if I create only AL code, just pure AL, no, no external calls to SQL or web services or anything, it's in the neighborhood of 300,000 statements per second. Um, 
whether it's 200 something or 400 something doesn't matter it's that's actually fast SQL access on the other hand e I mean just the latency between machines and SQL delivering results and so on limits this to approximately 300 queries per second you see that's a factor of thousand and obviously some SQL statements I mean if they include joins or big data sets they may even take seconds right another thing we also looked at is what's the ratio I mean if you take a look at some code unit or some your own code or our code how many pure AL statements do you have and how many database calls do you have and I made a very simple count just took all, all the code units because code units mainly consist of code uh, so I counted all the statements and then I counted all the database related statements and it's approximately a ratio 1 to 10 or 10 to 1 as I write it there which means that on average when you execute code I mean you click something or open a page or something on average we'll execute 10 A lines before we hit a SQL statement and you can see during due to this uh, the other two lines we basically only care about SQL statements for the same matter which is also what Vincent pointed out now that was boxy pointed at, pointing out so inside our NST we have a thread scheduler um, that will I mean some of you may have seen a picture like this before so when you have many pr simultaneous processes we do a slicing where we allocate 50 milliseconds to each process in a round robin fashion and the number of active simultaneous threads is three or four I think depends on how many cores we have on the actual CPU and we should also note that we do prioritize uh, UI sessions over background sessions or web service requests so this is a new feature coming in the next update so we're not doing yet but in with 15.1 we added a new feature when we prioritize UI sessions versus I think sessions. we actually have been running with that for some time no no, no? okay we should <laughs> anyways that that's a prioritization matter here if you look closer at what happens within those 50 milliseconds I get so by the way that one is just drawn in Excel which means that it looks like all the slots are in synchronous uh, are synchronous they are not obviously each lane is different so you click a button or open a page and you get allocated a slot of mil 50 milliseconds so how do you use it well you, you run maybe maybe not 10 AL lines on average statistically as we show and with that speed that takes zero point nothing right seconds or milliseconds so Im almost immediately you will hit I mean statistically speaking almost immediately you will hit a SQL statement so we do create this SQL statement send it to SQL and then we wait for the result but since we know that that can take ages to get back we give the th give the threat to the next session or uh, yeah, client session so somebody else can get there 50 milliseconds yeah but again this is in 15 so before it was a bug and it wasn't true because we are not, not always giving up the time slot back to the scheduler correct so it will also be good, great improvement in performance in next update yes exactly but it also means another thing that's important to notice that if there's a big load on the server so let's say that you have 100 users and a lot of background sessions um, those three I mean now we, you only have five there right but imagine you have hundreds of sessions then when you when SQL returns with the result that you're interested in interested in maybe you need to wait for the next bus to arrive right or next train to arrive I mean you need to wait for your next 50 milliseconds to arrive 
Another implication of this also is that 50 milliseconds sounds like very little, but it's actually a long time because within a whole second, which is an, a very long time, there are only 20 slots. Right? So there are only 20 slots times the number of threads, so that, that may only be maybe 60 slots per second. This is just to give you some of the fundamentals that <laughs> we're dealing with. And this is the same on-premise, obviously, <coughs> in your own S NSTs. So, yeah, with that, I will hand it over to <coughs> Alex, who will get this magic wand. Yeah. So let's talk about the cloud service performance. And uh, when you look about per to the to performance, there are at least three components you need to be aware of. The first of all is the service compute performance, and that is something you cannot do anything about. This is internally for Microsoft, and that we're trying to improve how to run our service. Of course, there is the database performance, and there are also multiple kind of, uh, things in, in this. So one is the amount of queries and the how good are queries you're running, but the second is how good the database performance is. And the third thing is application. And uh, we'll try to cover all three things today. And let's start with uh, computes. So this picture is showing uh, all our clusters, all our data plane services. And you can see here that each, each, each rectangle is a dedicated service fabric cluster. And the size is actual, the relative uh, load on this cluster. So you can see some of the rectangles are really big, meaning that they are getting a lot of requests, there are a lot of tenants, and some of them barely visible here. And that was the problem last year when we just started looking to this. And the problem because <coughs> happened uh, because of the way we are getting new tenants. When tenants are coming and getting trial tenants, we assign these tenants uh, to a cluster and they stay there for quite some time, at least until the next update where we can move them around. And a lot of tenants just trying the product and maybe they will come back in the next day, in the next week, but maybe they'll never come back. But they still exist on, on, the, on the cluster. And the way we did balancing before was based on the total amount of tenants per cluster. So I will not give you the number because it's changed, but here it, all, ten, all clusters have the same amount of tenants, but tenants are di of different size and different, doing different activities. So that's what we tried to improve. If you look to this picture, it's showing uh, all services we're running in the data plane. You can see NST in the middle and all services around it. And I will not talk about all of them, uh, but I will describe our recent additions. Uh, you can see here it's a gateway service and the tenant balance service. They was deployed a few months ago, and uh, I'll explain actually what, what they're doing. If you, uh, the, the way we take uh, Navision to the cloud was very simple, right? We, we take NST and WebCore, we move it to virtual machines in the cloud, put load balancer in front, and use simple route robin to distribute requests among machines. And what it lead to, let's say you have a user from one tenant. Oh, sorry, it's a different slide. So let's, we change slides a little bit before presentation. So let's step back. Let's talk about synchronization first uh, and why, why this is a problem. The way we do uh, cache synchronization uh, in Navision or Business Central is very simple. So all machines uh, connected or talking to each other through application database. And whenever somebody uh, reading and writing da uh, re reading data, let's say user one from first tenant reading sales order, the request going to tenant database and then uh, the data resides on in, in the cache in, the, in one machine. When another user from the same tenant creating like new sales order or updating an existing sales order, the data also read into tenant database, but also we write into application database to a special table called cache synchronization, and uh, all other machines listen to changes for the, in this uh, table, and when they get the message that somebody changed sales order table, they will flash caches. <coughs> so if you have multiple users write into data on different machines, they will flash caches constantly, and you'll always get cold cache. And this is a problem for performance. Uh, so here you'll see that this, you will flash the cache, and next time 
the first user will read sales order, it will not read it from the cache, but go again to the database. So the first improvement we did in this area is we increased the performance or increased the speed of delivering these messages across machines. Instead of using an application database, we start using uh, Azure Service Bus. This is more reliable and more performance solution, and we see some performance improvement in this area. But, so this is just showing the flow. So the flow is exactly the same, but just using different communication me mechanism. But now let's talk about balancing and why it's important here. So as I said before, we used a uh, very simple round-robin algorithm, and we used the Azure Load Balancer. This is L4. I think it's some hardware in the data center which distributes requests, and it worked very simple, right? If you have a first user coming, we put it to one machine. Maybe another user from the same tenant coming, we put it to another machine, and user from this, like another tenant, get one of the machines. It was more or less random, right? It just round-robin distributed requests. And uh, the problem with this approach, there are multiple problems. I say the first one is the cache, and the second one is uh, the load is very unequal. Because so we treat requests from users and from all data the same way. Uh, but the problem that user requests, they, when they came to machine, they should stay on the machine because of the session. And uh, we can see some like skewed machines with a lot of sessions, some machines with <coughs> less sessions. So the first thing we did, we create our own gateway service, this is L7 balancer, which gives us ability to control how we balance uh, users and tenants across nodes. And on the first iteration, it was working pretty much the same, it used a round-robin algorithm, and this was deployed like almost like eight months ago, and there was nothing really changed. But the next step, what we did, we created a new service called tenant balancer service, which uh, keeping the mapping of tenants to machines. And what happened now is if you have a first user from the first tenant mapped to machine one, and you have another user from the same tenant coming, we are putting it to the same machine, like if possible, because sometimes we have very big customers and we need to distribute them across multiple nodes. But in Happy Pass scenario, we're trying to put all tenants from the same, or all users from the same tenant to the same machine. So they always get a warm cache and much better performance. Now you can see that user from another tenant coming, we're putting it potentially to another machine. Uh, because of this, we also have to improve uh, our task scheduling. Uh, so task scheduling is the underlying technology on, under job queues. So all our job queues behind and using task scheduler. And <coughs> uh, we're actually now doing the same thing. So when tasks need to be run, we're asking tenant balancer for a specific machine where the task need to be executed, and then task scheduler put this task uh, to this machine. It's also, in, so, so in some cases, it's, it's, it's good because it gives you also warm cache, but in some cases, it can be bad because it put a load on the node and then, but here we're, we're experimenting. So we are, we are trying to put uh, some tasks to different nodes and maybe create dedicated machines which run in only tasks, but this is coming in the near future. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about, about telemetry. So for the last few months, I was involved in a uh, few uh, performance investigations where I have uh, very big uh, customers. So the one example I will show here, it was a customer with more than 100 users. They had some performance issues with their solutions and we, we tried to analyze and help, help them to make it much faster. So in order to do it, uh, internally we have built a special report. Actually, you can see it is built on Power BI. And it gives us overview on all different aspects of performance for this specific tenant. So this is, the first thing we're looking at is the performance of the cluster where the tenant is located. So in this example, you can see a few charts. Uh, the first two charts, uh, the first chart on, on the top is shown uh, web core, it's our web server component, uh, CPU utilization. Uh, the one below is shown NST utilization and on the right shown the memory utilization. And you know, we're running multi-tenant systems, so sometimes, unfortunately, you may experience bad performance not because of you, but because of somebody else. There are some tenants, which we call them noisy neighbor guys. They can run some very expensive iterations and they can affect performance of the whole cluster. We're trying to solve it. We're monitoring, monitoring it. We're trying to move tenants. And you also know that now we're introducing some throttling mechanisms to avoid these situations. 
But this is kind of the first thing we're looking at. So if somebody experienced performance issues, we look to the cluster performance. Uh, the second thing for us is to see if Tenor has any degradation in performance is to look to the, some common operations, right? We cannot look to it across the tenants because tenants have different uh, data, there are different customizations, but for one tenant, I think it's a very good metric to look on, 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 comp on open company. So the first chart shown here is uh, how many times it was called, and for this tenant, you probably don't see it, but there are a couple of thousand times per hour we call open company, and the chart below shown the performance, and it's, I think it's, it's pretty good here. It was some problems at the beginning, so maybe for us it was indicated that, that we need to go and investigate what's going on there. <coughs> we also look into this uh, amount of sessions created. And so this was one of the biggest customers we have, hundreds of users, and you can see that most of the sessions it created are background sessions, so the teal color. The yellow one is the web service calls, and there are almost no UI sessions in the chart, but in reality there are like 5,000 something sessions created. And sometimes we also see that maybe you run a lot of uh, integration scenarios, you call a lot of web service calls, it gives you bad performance. Another metric is, which is very important for us and for you is database performance. So again, when we look at this, first of first thing, because we're running in the elastic pools, we're looking to the pool performance. We look to CPU and, uh, and I.O. utilization of the databases. This is the right chart at the bottom. And here you can see the database utilized almost like from 5 to 10%, which is not so bad. You, the customers probably will not experience any issues here. But there are two other metrics which are also very important. The first one on the top, I hope you're using, when you run on-premise, you also look to these metrics in the same way. Uh, the chart on top showing the weight stats from the SQL Server. And uh, this is different types of uh, weights when SQL Server operations wait for something. Uh, most of the times we see that SQL waits on the logs. Right? So that is something you can improve. Maybe with our help, you need to see uh, you need to try to avoid the locking on, on your queries or make the queries running faster so they lock for only for the short period of time. In this specific case, actually, I don't know if you can see, that, but the most of the weights are caused by network I.O. And that means that NST is not really doing good. Uh, that actu actually SQL Server is much faster. It's in SQL Server, you have a data which we can consume, but we're just not doing it for some reasons. It may be because we have a lot of requests or it may be high CPU on the NST, need to be investigated. And the one below shown actually the queries, actual SQL queries, and the time uh, they executed. So sometimes you can see very big queries or very large queries. We saw a lot of examples when people forget to put proper filters and they try to get all data from the SQL server, which will be shown in this kind of chart. Uh, another thing, as Vincent mentioned, it's our focus for the next release, is the report execution. We saw a lot of problems caused by the reports. And uh, it's not only reports, but you know, any, any operations run, run as a reports it can be the problem. And typically, they are long-running operations. And uh, our recommendation here is try, just take, take a look to see w which reports you're running and see if you can avoid to run them during business hours. Because uh, some of the operations are really, really heavy, doing a lot of logs and doing a lot of CPU consumption. And uh, also, we saw a few really bad examples when people were out of curiosity trying to run some report and they forget to put any filters. So I think the, best, the worst example I saw was the one report which took about 10 gigabyte of data in memory just for the data set. And you can imagine how fast it was to, to print this report. In order to fix this, also there are new feature coming. So we're introducing new timeout feature on the report, so you, on the request page you will, be, you will be able to set a timeout, and by default it will be probably small, maybe five, 10 minutes, it needs to be decided in the future. But if you know, if you know that your report needs to be run longer, you will be able to change it on the request page and maybe schedule it or you print it immediately, but be aware that you may affect performance of all other customers if you're running really long reports. Uh, in, another good, good indicator 
is uh, on after get record. Uh, again, on, on the worst case I saw, uh, it was about a minute to execute this uh, event. And for us, it, it, it's typically indication that you have some extensions which are doing not good things and which affect customer performance. And of course, we're looking on, in general on the some application scenarios on open form, uh, open page time. And the teal color, color here is showing, uh, we, we call it waste time. This is a time, uh, <coughs> this time is, is visible if it's above uh, threshold. Or our UX team give us some kind of guidelines that the page needs to be open, open less than I mean, two, three hundred milliseconds. And if we're doing it longer, it will be shown in this report. And then we need to optimize. You can see here that the dialogue is the worst uh, page here, but actually it's not true. In this case, it's just waiting for the user input or user waiting while the user press OK or cancel. And it's showing it this time, but it's not so bad. So internally, when we talk about telemetry, okay, so it's very simple. We're using old, very well known ETW. And when you run on premise, you can see the same telemetry yourself. Of course, on our scale, when we have hundreds or thousands of clusters with thousands of machines, it's not really working like this. So we have our internal tooling. And this is an example of a tool called Kusta Explorer. That's our internal tool. It's not available publicly. And uh, just to show an example, I did a very simple query for one just random tenant uh, for the just 10 minutes of operations. And I don't know if you can see it here. Right, but it's a pretty big number. So for the 10 minutes, there are more than 70,000 records in our telemetry for one tenant. So it's an enormous amount of data we're capturing. And actually, our goal in the near future, the, the report I showed you, right, it's a lot of data, but unfortunately, it's not available for you directly. So in some cases, we can send this information to you, but it's very specific cases where you have like really bad escalations uh, need to be track through our support team. But our goal for the next year is that we'll be able to give all this information for you. So you'll be able to build this kind of reports from, from a partner telemetry. And as Vincent showed today, uh, we're starting this process. So we're giving in some telemetry now for you in the up and side. And I'll show a very quick demo how you're going to set up and how up and side telemetry looks like. So let me go to my machine. And while you do that, I can just mention that, for instance, when we get a user report that user says when they do something and it shows an error in their UI, you know, you cannot blah or you have to do blah, then we can actually go into Kusto, the query that you just saw. We can search for that specific thing and then we can see the error message and we can see the, uh, the call stack. You know, this was called from page something that called code unit this and table that. So for us, it's a fantastic tool to actually pinpoint bugs or user errors. OK, so let's go back to telemetry. The first thing you need to do is actually you need to create your own up-and-side uh, service or resource. And I created one before presentation called Navtech Days. And if you go there, on the overview page, you can see a field called instrumentation key. Oh. Ah, you cannot see it. No, it's... Okay, no. Now I can see it again. <laughs> and if you, you need to copy this key, and then if you go to your admin center for your tenant, and you choose your environment you want to set up this key for, I have only one environment called production. If I go to this environment, there is a new button called application inside key. So when I press it, actually I already enabled it, but you need to enable it, you need to put this key, you just co copy it, and you save it. Just be aware that this operation will do restart of your tenant, so it can cause some downtime for your customers. So don't do it on the live system and don't do it during business hours. So I will not save it, uh, but that's the way to set it up. So, and it's done. So that's it. So when you run your operations or run your tenant, it starts getting the telemetry in the up and sides. And the way to see it, again, it's very simple. So you go to up and side, you find the log analytics. And on the left side, 
See, they also have this nice feature called ghosting. So you see all the tables here. And the, we are writing our telemetry to the traces table. So if you go and let's write some very simple queries. So we'll go to see all the telemetry for the last oh, five days. And let's run it. Okay, so you can see that Business Central is very fast, so I have only one <laughs> performance <coughs> message here saying that one action was took longer than expected. And if, it, if you expand it, you can see, if you go to custom dimensions, you can see that the actual object ID. You can see object name, and there was a page, sales quotes, it took longer. You can see AL call stack, so you can see exactly where it happens. And the most important part here, you can see actual SQL statement. And uh, it's not very convenient here to analyze, but you can copy it and <coughs> you can see why it potentially was slow. And I, I will show a few examples why queries can be slow. Yeah, so that's very simple. And uh, for now, let me get back to presentation. So this is backup slides if the demo doesn't work. So for now, we, we're showing only long running SQL statements here. But there are a few coming in the future, a few more. So first of all, of course, we sh we'll show some errors. We'll definitely show re report execution time and page load time, and maybe something else. So there are different teams now adding new telemetry, which will be released very soon. And what I would like to ask you is, like, let us know what you would like to see in this telemetry from us, and go here and Maybe add your requests and vote for existing requests so we can add telemetry in the future. So I'll we'll give you, probably we'll share the slide so you can, you can see it later. The links on only take a picture. <coughs> now uh, let's talk about profiling and let's, let's see some examples why, why actually queries can be slow. So first of all, I want to mention that when, when, you run, when we are running Business Central in the cloud, it's exactly the same binaries of NST as you can get on premise. So whenever you think about some performance scenario you want to test, it would be nice that you will start first on your developer machine, on your own setup, you run all your favorite pro profiling tools and performance tools. And I will show you just a few of them, a very quick demo. So first of all, just remember that the old nice SQL profiler is still your friend. And this is the first quiz here, so I, I run profiling on the test which Henrik will show today. And actually I found a bug, you know. All of you experienced developers probably see the bug here immediately. So the first one who will raise a hand and show it to me, I'll get a special prize. I'll give it a few minutes to see. Like, no, nobody? Okay, I'm just kidding. So, but actually there is a bug. There is a very severe bug I found when I was preparing for this presentation. As I, actually it's, it's our bug, so shame on us. And it was for a pretty long time. Apparently, you know, when we run uh, code in uh, NAV, it's running different isolation mode, different transactions levels. So we run read transactions, write uh, update transactions, update no log transactions, and so on. And what it means, when we run execute queries, we add a special hints to the, to the queries, like read with, uh, with read uncommitted or read with update log, and so on. And apparently we never add this hint for extension tables in some scenarios, not always, but in some scenarios it was never added. And it, that can cause really heavy excessive locking on your system. And we saw few production scenarios when it happened. Now we know why. And I, likely it's fixed now and it's deployed I think this week to the production and uh, you'll get it to the next CU on premise. And so it's, it's a good thing. Uh, now let's see one live demo. I'll show you my favorite way of profiling application. I think you, you saw this tool before, but I don't think anybody, at least on this conference, showed it this way. Uh, so let me show this tool called dot trace. I think all of you know it. And uh, my personal favorite way of profiling is use timeline profiler. Uh, just be aware, so if, if you want to do timeline profiling, 
don't attach to a running process, but just let's uh, start. Uh, let's just profile local application. You'll get much more data if you do it this way and not attach to running application. So if we choose timeline profiler and we, here you just find uh, your local, mm. you should see here, ah, sorry, so it should be Windows Service and it should be Microsoft Dynamics Business Central. The search doesn't work here. But so let me run it. So when we do it this way, the server will be restarted, apparently. So and it can be slow, but may maybe I'll not waste your time on this one because it's my machine is not really performing now. Okay, so but l let me just sh show you the result of my previous profiling. So the profiling is very simple, right? I just run one unit test during and record the profile. Actually, the actual test, uh, Henrik will explain what it, what it is doing, <laughs> but let's see on the result. So when, when you're done with uh, this timeline profiling, you'll see this picture. And the, the middle section showing you all, this, all threads which are working uh, on the NST at the same time. You can see all timings here, and you can see small charts uh, like this, showing that this thread actually was very active and doing something. But let's focus on SQL operations. So luckily, this tool can show you all SQL queries executed during this profiling time. It's a not very nice window, but you, you can expand it. And let's make it bigger. So the, the cool thing about it that it's showing you the time execution time for this query. And you can probably see some problems or you can see some statements which should not be executed at all during your profile or let's, <coughs> uh, so I'll show you a few examples. So one, one of them, let, let's see what happens here with integration records. Yes, sir. So you can see that there are two queries doing something with integration records which in total takes for about a second for these two queries, right? And this is a like thing which we, we can approve now because uh, with new feature called system IDs, this scenario will be running much faster. And we do it, we already did it for a few scenarios with integration records. You'll see performance improvements here. But what I want you to focus on is, is isolation mode for your queries. So let, let's see, for example, what is running with update logs. CK. Yeah, it's very slow. There are a lot of queries, but for example, this query, right? Uh, if you can not see it, but this query doing some aggregations. And do it, does it really need to be with update log? Probably not. And this query was running for 200 milliseconds, and that means that all the records which get to this query, which was ag aggregated, was locked and nobody will be able to see them in the product. So this get, gives a like, really bad user experience for the customers if you have a lot of locks like this. So when you do profiling, go and check that all your statements have a proper isolation mode. And sometimes maybe you need to commit before or do operation in different transaction just to avoid the locking. And m maybe we should add that that's something we actually are debating internally whether we should continue. So I guess you have tried this yourself. You do a lock table on some record. You start working on it. Then you call some other function, you know, in another code unit that does a find or count or something on that same table. And everything is locked. I mean, everything you touch or count is locked. Is that desirable? I mean, I would say no, but I mean, should we disable this locking of everything you touch after you issue the table lock or 
And should we only keep it to that specific record instance you actually defined it on, you know, customer.logtable? I mean, p please go to ideas and say this, because when we suggest this internally, you know, people say, oh, but that will break scenarios. M maybe, maybe not. So just something to consider. But it's not in the works now, it's just something we're debating, because we see these locks in real life. So, yeah. But just my message, he my message here is just go and check your SQL statements. Just see what you execute and see that they have proper isolation levels. And of course, the second thing is the application performance. And I think this tool is also great for looking to uh, your application performance. Because on here on the right, you can see all the methods which are executed. You can see the total time. You can see what they're doing. Or you can also see all the memory allocated and so on. And I just I will show you a few tricks how to make it better. Because right now, it's a lot of... I would say noise, and there are a lot of functions which you don't care about. So there is a magic button here, very small, saying like, show me only system, uh, only user methods, not system methods. And you can see, immediately there are, <coughs> there are all code units, all records executed here. But there are some of them which are still considered to be noise, like Windows servers. But you can easily exclude them. So if, if you right click and say mark them as a system, so they will disappear. So you can do it for all like types and methods which you're not interested in, and then you get all like your actual your code units, your tests, and I can probably see my test here what it was doing. Uh, so this one, that's, that's the test I run, the test open sales order form. You can click on it. You can you can say I want to merge all occurrences, and then you on the left you see all information is updated. You can see all SQL statement which was executed by this specific test. You can see all memory allocated. You can see how much time it spent on the JIT compilation and how much time it spent on the weights. So I think it's a very powerful tool, and I'll encourage you to start using this in this way. Oh, maybe the last slide I want to <coughs> I want to show you. It's also remember that also query store is a very powerful feature, and I also encourage you to use it. So this is the actual query I used last week to find very bad performance issues with for one customer, and this query is showing you actually sort like top 50 queries which experience locks. And the total, wa total time this query was waiting on the logs. And uh, you can copy it, or you, you can use it. And we have a plan to add these capabilities to the product itself. So maybe we're debating how it's going to be looked. But maybe we'll put it to telemetry or maybe to admin center. You'll be able to click and see all slow queries for this specific tenant. <coughs> but for now, yeah, you can just use it on premise or wait until it's shown in telemetry. I'll give the word to Henry. Yes, thank you. So, um, as Boxy mentioned this morning at the keynote, uh, we've invested a bit in uh, trying to write some uh, lightweight, um, uh, easy to use performance regression test. It's important to say regression test because that's basically the primary focus. Um, so, what I'll be showing here is just how you can get up and running with this in VS Code uh, using a out of the box Docker image. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of uh, demos and how you can use the data. And then finally, I'm just going to give you sort of a, a quick uh, preview of uh, a more sort of user friendly tool that we've built for this. Um, let's see. Uh, so why, why do we want to use these uh, performance regression tests? Um, it's, it's basically um, because we want to make sure as complexity grows, as scenarios expand, as, uh, for instance, platform change, uh, this might also affect the application. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's important for us to, uh, to be aware of. So the uh, sort of the, the snippet I pasted in at the bottom here kind of shows uh, our current uh, lab. Uh, this goes on for every build, as, as Bakshi also mentioned. Um, 
And as you can see, the numbers are fairly high, so how do we interpret this? This is all uh, automated today. So today, if you as a developer somewhere uh, introduce a regression, uh, we will uh, find it, we will find the check-in, and we'll send you an email with instructions on how you can go about it, and that's, that's basically how it works. But this, if, if you want to just jump in, you can quickly get uh, the overview, so that, that's basically how, how we're using it. But um, so what is it actually that we do? So uh, as has been mentioned a couple of times, we basically count uh, the statements executed and we do the row reads. So here I, I took a, a snippet from uh, code unit uh, 80. And um, the, execution, uh, the, the, the statement is basically, uh, now that I've filtered on the, on the sales order, we, we basically go through all the sales lines and we do the reads. And um, that's, that's basically what we're interested in. And the reason for that is obviously as we, uh, if we kind of increase in statements, there could be something that we, we need to look into, which is important. As Bardo mentioned to begin with, uh, there is a, a latency um, introduced as well. So that's why it's, it's even more important to, to keep uh, track of these. So I will... It's not introduced, it's just there. It's, it's, also, it's also there on-prem, I would say. But yeah. Yes, but in, in the cloud we have that extra millisecond as well, or was that also You on? also have that on, on okay. premise. It depends on h how far you place your machines, yeah. between, or not, not physical distance so much, but as how many routers and stuff you have in between. Yeah, good. Okay, um, so I just want to show you my small sample here. Um, so basically, this is just uh, a VM. It's a Docker uh, in Azure. It's a Docker image running in Azure, so it's out of the box. I installed the test toolkit, and now I'm able to uh, create this. So my test object in this case is the sales order list. And as you can see, I'm instantiating a number of variables, and that's basically because uh, what I'm interested in is from uh, the point in time where my test basically starts, which is the sales order, loading the sales order list, and then until it finishes. And if I just counted it afterwards, I would get everything up until that point. So that's why I'm insta in instantiating these variables. So inside the test, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, I always use the latest version, and that's to ensure I don't have any caching, which would uh, confuse it. Uh, and here you can see I'm kind of setting uh, up until this point, give me the, the count from the session information uh, object. Uh, then I go ahead and I simply open up the, the sales order list. Uh, I then do another read from the, the session information object. I close the page and then I finally do sort of the delta and I put in a breakpoint at the, at the end of it and that's just to um, be able to show you the results because this one I didn't create in kind of UI. So I'll just go ahead and do an F5 here. Um, fingers crossed. I'll log in. <laughs> didn't mean that. Um, yeah. So um, here we are. I'll go and fetch my test unit. This one about the perf order list. And just run it, and hopefully I will break, which I did. And so now you can see that I have a total of 187 row reads, and I have uh, executed 85 SQL statements. Um, so as you will note, also, if you uh, have tried this, but you can also go into your uh, variables when you're debugging and here you will basically be able to see sort of what uh, Alexander also showed in the profiler. You can basically go in here and you can see the, the statement that we're firing. Uh, standard, this is only set up for, I think it's 10 statements, but you can set it up to basically show you everything. Um, okay, so now let's... Uh, Let's jump into maybe a slightly more. This was actually the, the, the test that flushed out that uh, bug you, you mentioned, Alexander. So um, 
it's sort of in the same um, category, but I'm just, what I'm doing now is I'm actually trying to create more of an average, and we use averages because we don't, we're not interested in, in maybe one um, spike. We're more interested in, in posting a lot or doing a lot of operations to be able to, to measure these in a more accurate way, you can say. There, there will always be deviations, and the reason for those deviations is that because basically it's, it's, it's code. It's supposed to be the exact same thing. But um, in the whole stack, there are uh, elements that we do not control. And uh, that means there could be caching uh, kicking in. There could be uh, other uh, aspects of, of the full stack that will just uh, influence the results. So they will differ a bit. But I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, anyway, let's, let's jump back into this one. Um, so same setup as the last time. This time I'm, I'm setting up this variable where I say, well, uh, let, let's do 10 sales orders. You can see I have a small loop here that then goes in and creates a new header, puts in some lines. Um, and then I basically do the same thing where I'm counting um, things. And then I put in this little assert down here. But that's just ma mainly just to show us uh, the results at the end. So this time I will just go ahead and do a control F5. <coughs> yeah. I'll just go and fetch that one. There we go. So we have this new one. We're just going to run the selected one, and um, so that's not a, you could say, a, a big deal, right? I mean, we just saw how that worked, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce uh, another extension in the mix, and I'm, and I'm sorry it's not that uh, fancy, this extension that I've uh, created here, but I, c I call it the bestseller extension, so whenever somebody buys more than... Uh, 10 of a given item uh, could coincidentally be the one that I'm selling uh, the bicycle. Um, it will add a comment on the uh, record um, on, on the customer uh, just to let me know that this customer is, is uh, buying a lot. Um, so um, let's just go ahead and deploy that one. So this is where I think it kind of, what I'm trying to demo here is basically that as time passes and more complexity is added, you have more extensions maybe in a, in a live environment, in a live production environment, it will definitely influence uh, the number of statements you make, uh, hence latency, um, other issues could occur. So here we are, here's the um, extension, I, I will... Um, spare you the suffering of seeing it, it work, so we we'll just have to trust me. Uh, so I'm just highlighting this so we can quick, ah, that's a little difficult to see, but uh, I, can, I can give you the numbers here. So we had a 1587 uh, recount and we had uh, 1861 statements. So let's just try and run it again now with my extension uh, in the mix. And we'll see a, a small increase. Um, so this time I'm at 1968 and, and 1862. So, so basically it's bumped up um, with, with some, some more statements. And, and that's just to kind of make the point. So let me just see. Are we still running over here? Um, yeah, so we went through that, we introduced a new functionality, and over time it can basically pose a risk. Um, and as Baro mentioned, you know, one statement, uh, three milliseconds, so a thousand statements is basically uh, three seconds, and we just saw how much I added by, with this simple, uh, relatively simple setup. So I, I um, just add that a very, very popular regression is to subscribe to unmodify of a table mm. because if you somewhere have you know a modify all which is one SQL statement 
that is turned into a loop if you subscribe to the unmodified event because we need to call the event for each record, right? So that's a very easy and popular way to make regressions. Yeah, good point. So um, I'll just try and demo this uh, tool. So let me swap back. So I have two VMs going here. Um, so let's just see. Hopefully we can get away with just a simple refresh. Uh, we haven't shipped this yet. Um, we're working on that. We just need to work through some details. There are still some uh, small tweaks we want to do. But as you can see, it's basically the same test runner as we just looked at. Um, but this one has more. Uh, you, you can basically get the, the metrics you're looking for uh, right, right here. Um, so here we already created a bunch of tests. Uh, the first thing I want to just show you is the baseline version, which is uh, another uh, smart thing. So um, I run my first test, um, call it my baseline, the 16 of in this case, and now I'm starting to add runs. And you can imagine I do this during my uh, development. And as you can see, the different uh, metrics are changed. Sometimes there's a, a regression introduced. Now, these would typically be what I refer to um, just a, a little while ago about the, the, we, we don't control the full stack. This would typically not be a full regression because I'm actually running on the exact same uh, bits. So without uh, further ado, I'm just going to rerun the selected ones. So my baseline is 16.02. Uh, and now you can see when I rerun the exact same test, I actually have some, uh, some, some small regressions. And this is why we care about averages. This is why we try to uh, basically build up more uh, large scale tests when, when we do this. So rerun it again. And you can see it kind of varies a bit. And then I can go in and save these runs. Um, we could call this one 1603, for instance. And so another thing um, related to this, which is also, um, I think it's, it's just a very lightweight demo of how you can use this, but we could go in and basically take a look at all our test runs. And then we could uh, go into an, an open it uh, in Excel. And this would be sort of like the, the diagrams I, I've, uh, we, we've shown you this morning about uh, the reporting we do. This is, it comes from Power BI, but that all stems from a database where we basically load in the results. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly do an enable editing, um, insert it into a pivot. Yes, please. Uh, I'm gonna do the version. I'm gonna do my test name, the rows, uh, and the statements executed, and that's it. And then I'm gonna do a pivot chart. I'm gonna do the column diagram. And this is just to show you how visually you can uh, compare this. And it's, it's a nice way for, for, uh, to, to report out maybe to other uh, stakeholders or other engineers about um, how the current uh, performance is, is doing. Um, let's see. Yeah, so as I mentioned, it's not released yet, so we're, we're still uh, working on that. Um, I have my clicker here. Um, so um, basically, when, when you export it to Excel, as I mentioned, there are a couple of, of benefits from this. I took roughly sort of, maybe you already saw this as part of the keynote. Uh, we have the timer test as well going, uh, but it, it fluctuates a lot. It's, it's very difficult to go in and say, okay, we probably have a regression. We can see there's a trend. But we don't really know with the with the counting the SQL statements. Um, at least to to us, it's it's more stable uh, to to read from, and it's also more agile uh, in the sense that I can rerun this as many times as I want to while I'm developing uh, my code. I don't need to wait for a full build, put it into a lab, and wait for the all these timers and all this test to kick off. This one is is lightweight. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, so just a couple of uh, resources around uh, setting up a general testing. Uh, we haven't really, um, I don't think so at least, I haven't seen any documentation about doing these uh, type of performance testing, but we will provide uh, information. 
And with that, I think I want to pass it on to you, Badwa. Yep. So this section will be quick because, first of all, each of the topics are easy to speak about, but also most of it was shown in the keynote anyway. So, so we have a new features, and we're only showing the ones that have to do or somehow are related to performance. So one is the new number sequence. Um, and I guess you all attended the keynote, so I'll just point out that you can create an, a number sequence with a sequence name, starting number and so on, and you can get an X and you get the current. And this code is from the number series code, uh, number series functionality, and there's not, no mystery about this because this um, shows up in SQL as well. You can see under programmability sequences and you can see them. Yeah, I think it's important to add that you can enable it on your live system, right? On existing customers, you can enable it on existing number sequences. Yeah, yeah that's coming. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Just to mention that there's nothing mysterious about these number sequences, but it's something you can use for anything, basically. I mean, if you need any kind of integer counter, you can use it. And Vincent mentioned that you may not be guaranteed that the numbers are, sequ are sequential. The, you are, they are actually sequential. It, it's just that if you are in a transaction, you take a number, and then an error occurs and the transaction rolls back, then the numbers obviously not roll back. You already, you already know this feature from, or this concept from auto increment in tables, you have, if you have an integer ID. So we introduced this in, um, in the number series. Actually, the feature was made for number series because we had a lot of complaints about locking. And those of you who worked with number series would know that when you take a new number in a number series, we read the number series line record, the actor one, and then we increment the last used number and we stamp in the date, right? So what we introduced was this allow gaps in numbers to make it very clear that it has a cost. We could also have called it enable sequential numbers or something, but that wouldn't, that would hide the, the danger of it. So, and turn it, you can turn it on and off as you want, because the only thing in that is that there's a hidden field that holds the name of the sequence. And either you turn it on or off, we'll update that number or these. Um, but you, what you also can see is that, I won't put the laser in your light, in your eyes. Mm, we cleared thanks. the last date because we can't keep that date up to date without modifying the line, right? And then it's kind of pointless. Which also means that there is some feature of some certain number series that I can't remember, but one of them says guaranteed date sequence or something like that. That's obviously not possible. But for anywhere where you don't need this um, to be actually uh, sequence. And I'll repeat it again. Do not use this for posted invoices and so stuff like that. You can use it for customer numbers. I mean, you can create a customer and delete it. That's no different from using this number series. The other thing was page background tasks. So this is just one of the many examples. We have uh, you know, the activities queue in role centers. You have fact boxes. We can basically use it anywhere we want. This is how it looks like. This is the specifically one of the queues, uh, but Vincent explained it better at the keynote, which was sort. But the main point is you enqueue a background task and then you either wait for it to fail or to complete. And then you can exchange um, the result using dictionaries. And you are not allowed to do any writing in there which is inconvenient, I know, but we impose that limitation in order to avoid 
people setting something off in the background which doesn't update your foreground, right? So people would get these, you know, another user has modified this record thing, and you would get that even if you're the only person on the system. Also, we are contemplating, it's, it's not planned as such, we're discussing or debating whether to actually make this a more general thing so we inside regular AL code can spawn off sub um, processes. But that's not even on the whiteboard yet. Then there's the session, uh, ob session information object that Henrik just talked about and demoed, where you can get the numbers. Again, this is enough, has nothing to do with performance as such, but allows us to measure. Oh. And the last thing is immutable keys. And again, nothing mysterious. We add a system ID field or dollar system ID field to every table. We can use it. And even in, uh, in fact, boxes, right? If you have ever tried to do anything generic, you would have you would have liked to use record ID, right? Now we have it, kind of. And then also the read scale out. So we remember those data uh, mirror databases that just sit there and do nothing. So we want to utilize them, obviously. And SQL, also on-prem, by the way, allows you to do this. So you, when you make a call or a connection to SQL, you will actually get to a gateway, or a gateway ring. And what you can do there is you can say, what, what is my intent? Right? I intend to read only, or I, I intend to update. And then that gateway will decide whether to point you to the primary machine or one of the uh, secondary. There are a lot of secondaries here, you can see. We use two. Um, but this also works even if you don't have the mirrors. Then the gate will say, gateway will say, oh, there is only primary, and then it will route it to the primary. Yeah, this is basically the same. And we are, again, we're debating where to use it because uh, background, uh, web service re requests, the API pages, are an obvious thing to use it. Um, reports as well, queries obviously. But also we are debating uh, lists. So some of the very expensive queries we see is a user in a customer list or item list with a lot of, you know, outer joins with sums and whatnot, and then they do filtering and sorting. Since you are not updating the data in a list, why not route it to a mirror? And this is how it will look, maybe. This is just a newer prototype, so now it's not called read-only, as Vincent showed us, but now, now the name is called Data Access Intent, because that is more in line with what it's called in Azure, or in Azure SQL. And then we have a short session here on about coding for performance. And I'll take a simple example of how you can minimize number of SQL statements when writing a report. I'll tell you, which you already know, that you can schedule some things in the background task, so I'm not even going to demo that, and also talk very briefly about scale out because if there's any promise that the cloud is or Azure is about, it's about scaling out or parallelizing. I can see that we only have 50 minutes left. So I have taken one of the very simple reports, report four, the um, detailed trial balance, and I've stripped away all the fields and stuff. So you can see that we have the GL account that links to GL entry. And you might think, how many queries are here? Right? Well, there are as many queries as there are GL accounts, plus one, right? Because for every GL account, we issue a new query to read the GL entry. And think of another scenario, because usually you only have 
a couple of hundred yield accounts. But if you have items, for instance, where you can have thousands and thousands, and then you might have item ledger entry there, and maybe you even have value entries below, try to imagine how many sequels you actually will be firing against the server. Um, we were talking with the server guys to whether they could do this smarter, but at least you and I can do it a bit smarter. By the way, it's not only those two. We also have a calc sum down there, right? Calc fields. And for every GL account, we apparently need to figure out um, whether there's a GL entry there. And also, we do all this date thing. So the date, I didn't take the date, count the date here, because the date is a virtual table. It doesn't count as a SQL statement. But actually, most of this could be done on pre-record or pre-date item, correct? Yeah, so we have a lot of queries. And how, how could we improve this? So we could rewrite the report user query, and then adapt the data items. You know, you can change the data item to be an integer, and then you can add the fields to that integer and you can then we would need to adapt the RDLC or the layout to the new structure and we all love to edit in RDLC right <coughs> or a more lazy approach that I tried is to declare one global GL entry record right so we select every, do a fine set on GL entry And then we change the current GL entry item to be a temp table. And then we'll basically fill in the temp data item as we go, I mean, as the GL accounts uh, proceed. And if we care about the two others, you know, the calc sum and the date thing, then we can do that. So this is how the layout will be modified. The only thing we actually change here is that we, on the GL entry set, temp, use temp true. That's the only change to the layout. Everything else works. And as I said, with the date thing, we could just as well do that on pre-data item or somewhere else. And what we do there is we have this global GL account that copies the filters, and then we take this date filter and use autocalc fields, and then we prepare the data, a fine set, right? So now when we start the execution of the report, the GL account data item and this are in sync. Otherwise, we need to bring them in sync. And we remember that we do this, right? Because otherwise we'd need to ask every time. Mm. Yeah. So this is the modified repo. There are more code here in the on after get record, but it's not as bad as it looks. So most of this is to do the copy filters from the records down to the new. But if you take a closer look at the first thing, we basically make sure that the starting balance, the global account, is in sync, and then we take it from the auto -calc calced field, right? And then we do all this copy filtering thing, and then we start the global GL entry find set, I mean, the first time. Otherwise, we empty it, because now we're ready for the next loop. And down here, we first say, okay, I haven't found any entry yet. And while I'm pointing to the same account, then I copy into the temp table. And since I apparently I'm here, then I know I found one because then I can use it down here, right? Instead of doing that extra find set or find first. And basically, I only fill in the temp, and then I 
there to go, and then the report will handle the rest. And we try it if my client is still active. Oh, sorry. So I detail. I'll actually take my glasses here. Sorry. Detail. Balance. So this is the regular one. This is that one. I could run it here, but it'll just produce the same. So there's no fun in that. So what I did instead is I create a simple page where I can call them, and then I do the SQL count thing that Henrik showed, right? So the test page or test report. For performance. And I can I don't know if you need to exit your presentation mode because Ah, you're not seeing it. No. Thank you. That was good to know. I'll just do it like this. Anyways, to make it to be able to compare, I just create this small function that will run the two reports modally uh, from within this function and then I'll count the SQL statements before and after as Henrik showed you. And in order to not be accused of of benefiting from caching or anything, I'm running the new report, the V2 report first. So I'll just take everything and I will take this date range from, I think this is two years and I will send this to PDF. I don't know if you can read it, but it's, uh, it used 20 statements, 20 SQL statements. And this is the regular one, same parameters. It's kind of difficult to operate a laptop this way. 225, and that, that, that's only because this data set, this is the small Kronos demo data that only has a few accounts. If you use the slightly bigger one, the, the one we call extended or whatever, it's about 500 statements. So I will, so the timing is basically the same. If I can also run them, the timing, because when it's only a couple of hundred, you, I mean, the difference vanishes into, you know, seconds or milliseconds. But again, think of this being items and item entries and value entries in tree structure. Can I just kill this thing? Yeah. Did it matter? I mean, yeah, it did, right? Um, so the 597, that's with the the, the extended demo. And 18, that's what I got last time I ran it. So now it was 20. Apparently some metadata was there. The other thing is um, scaling out. So I don't have any concrete examples, but when you have something, if you do something with a lot of items, uh, I know it just cost is a bad example, but something that where you process all customers, all items, see if you can split them into chunks. And yeah, sorry, yeah, scale out and then get, get together again at the end. So we, we did this with, um, I mean, this already released a year ago, so maybe you've already seen the code here. So uh, when you import a RapidStart package, which is basically a zipped XML file, in there we get all the table nodes, which you know, in XML, each node represents a table with its metadata and all the entries. And then for each node, we take this node and depending on different things, we will import the data from XML. Or as we introduced, in certain cases, we say, um, if not in Excel mode, 
or there are very few, that then we'll do directly. Otherwise, we'll send it to a background session. Like there. I mean, the code is there. You don't need to copy this. Um, and then th th we'll send the blob to a background session and it will import. And at the end, you know, that corresponds to that one, we will wait for all to finish. Again, it, the code has been out there for a year or so. And did it matter? Yeah, I mean, on a slow, very slow trial machine, it used to take, what, you, what used to take 20 minutes now runs in 10 minutes. Yeah, I think that concludes mm -hmm. our session. So any questions? We have six-ish minutes left. Actually, an hour and six if we skip lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Should, do, do we have, did we have this? That's There's uh, the cube. Yeah. And we so have, we have t-shirts as well. We have prices. We have t-shirts, yes. but w yeah. We just, uh, the best questions. Best questions. Yeah. yeah. Or the, or the questions. First, first, maybe yeah. first question. Yeah. Oh, I'll just give it. <laughs> so you can throw it back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would have uh, two questions. First one is, could you compare the performance impact of uh, Word and RDRC layout, but also with custom layouts? Yeah. So, so if you, if you take, no, I'll step one step back actually first. So in statistics, we have been able to see that when you run a report on average, approximately 80% of the time is actually spent collecting data and then the last 20% rendering the data. So we're only, so what you're asking about is the last 20%, right? And when we, tested word reporting way back, it seemed that it was at least as fast as RDLC. I mean, you can, if you just look at word as such, then you can render a several hundred page word document within a second or two. So I think that part of the difference is neg negligible. What we, then you ask about custom layouts. So again, that's two answers. One is, you know, you create a, a layout for a report. That shouldn't change anything because actually fetching the layout, whether we fetch our own or the one you created, doesn't matter. That's the same. The other part is um, we introduced some time ago that you can for certain reports, like custom, uh, for invoices and such, sta and statements, you can specify a customer-specific layout. Is that what you're asking? Yes, no? yes. Yeah, because that's a different thing. That's customer-specific and not custom layout. So the customer-specific, in order to make that work, we need to create one report per customer to make this work. And that's obviously a lot more expensive. So instead of running, you know, making one report for 10 or 100 or 1,000 customers, now we not need to create, you know, 10 or 100 or 1,000 individual reports with each their own layout. So that, that has, that one has a huge performance impact. The second question is about, uh, you, you mentioned the on modify uh, and subscribing to it. Yes. And that it's a huge uh, performance uh, impact. It but is, yeah, I mean, compared to a modify all, right? Because yeah, that yeah. completely breaks the modify but all. It was introduced when the events, database events were introduced in this, in NAV. Actually. Yes. But why then not uh, have an, uh, tri uh, an event which triggers only when the modify, on modify trigger is being uh, validated? Because currently we have a, 
subscriber yeah. with the parameter. Why yeah, you mean mo uh, what modify yeah. true? Yeah, so that it triggers only when it needs to. Because I think uh, in this case you're having the impact performance impact even though you don't want to run. I agree, and that has been debated even before this was ever <laughs> released. And, uh, and okay. I think it ended as it did because we want to be sure. Let's say that you create your own ta a new table. I mean, you create an extension, not, not the modern extension table, but another table that you want to be in sync with some other table. Then you subscribe to the unmodify and insert and un delete for that specific record. And if you do that, would you would then want to rely on every developer and every extension developer ever to remember to write modify true? That's basically the discussion. But I agree it would be nice if we could unsubscribe that one. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be optional, actually, not like... But for whom? Will the developer forgets it? Or, I mean, the, the point is, do you want to be absolutely sure that your table is in sync with some other, regardless, ooh, about, regardless of who writes the code? That's the only one use case you're mentioning now, synchronizing. I mean, there might be other stuff that I want to do on, you know, modify, right? Uh, true, true. Mm -hmm. But anyways, th that, that's the discussion that happened back then. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. But that was a two good questions. I think that, that warrants uh, t -shirt. a good yes. T-shirt. Thank you. Maybe one question? Yeah. One there. Oh, there are two questions then. So, so regarding the uh, event subscribers, yeah. um, wouldn't it be possible to, uh, because you're, you're supplying the run trigger, Sorry? You, you're, you're supplying the run trigger, right? In the uh, event, uh, event subscription. Yeah. So what if you say, okay, if this run trigger is not used, then skip all code in the event subscriber, and then also with a modify all, do not, uh, do not do it at all. Because but that's I whole, think we thing. do that, right? I, I mean, you, you wouldn't subscribe to it if there is no, no nothing you to you do, right? You get you get some code if, uh, if not run trigger, then exit. But if you have this yeah, code. But that's code. Yeah, but if you have this code, it will be triggered also with a, modif with a modify all. Yes. And it's not, it's not possible to sh just skip that? No, but again, it's the same discussion. Th then your other table that is rel relying on this table will be out of date right? or out of sync. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the, the, the short thing is to do don't subscribe to unmodify unless we need to. And there is an option that is difficult to use, and maybe we uh, or the platform guys should make it easier to manually subscribe to uh, to events, so it can be turned off, on and off, yeah. as needed. Okay. Uh, I think there was no, there two more questions. Okay. Yeah, I think you need to give those T-shirts out because nobody wants them, right? Or we don't have time to. Okay, can I throw yeah. back uh, more questions on the back? Uh, there, there was. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you for your session, first of all. Um, I had a question regarding um, um, page list, and uh, we historically had a scenarios where a customer wants to have more KPIs on a list, which potentially means that we need to have a more flow fields displayed, and yeah. this is uh, directly impacting the performance. Are you guys looking to have some sort of um, use case where we can use background tasks to load these flow fields? Yeah. As a, like an oh, the, the flow fields? Yes. Then you need to code it yourself. Uh, I mean, you on the actual line, you have flow fields, or are you talking about fact boxes? No, on, on an actual line. Yeah, that's a difficult one, actually. Um, I, I think the short answer is no. I mean, we, we are aware of the problem because we already have it because many of the lists like customer and items ha have so many flow fields already. So what we are debating is to getting back to, if, you, if anyone, one of you are old enough to remember the old seaside, if you, ha if you hit a column, make it non-visible, yep. then it wouldn't be calculated. Yes. Um, in the three-tier structure, it's not, that's not a trivial thing because 
what happens on the client is not necessarily known to the server. So currently the server gives everything to the client, but we should have a way to undo it. I mean, not calculate if it's not needed. Yeah, it would Th that's not exactly what you're asking about. I know that, but yeah, it would be kind of good if uh, there would be some kind of property where we can identify that this particular equation can be done, uh, kind of shipped to the background session, yes. which is a pa page background session, yeah. and it will behave the same as you guys have with kind of calculated afterwards. When yeah, we and we could we could do that, but there's another thing that another property of the back page background tasks, which is also by the, by the design, by the way, and which we have forgotten to mention, is that imagine you have um, a list, an effect box, and when you get on to the on after get record or current record on the list, you start up and, and you know the effect box gets activated. Right. Then uh, we start a pa page background task that will eventually update it. If the user then in between jumps to the next line, then this is useless, right? Yeah, so we actually automatically cancel the task. If the user moves, we cancel the task. <coughs> but that also means that we cannot use it for what you're asking oh, okay. yet. Or you can do it on the, if you have a header lines, so then you maybe can do it on the header because that doesn't change. <coughs> and then, but then it becomes pretty I would say involved. Uh, maybe, maybe it's not worth doing it. Yeah, but, uh, maybe to answer your question, maybe you should should consider a case where you create new table with all the KPIs and you calculate them not on demand, but yeah. you calculate them with bad jobs. Like yeah, that is true. I mean, you can you should definitely look at having some kind of caching mechanism. I mean, store store the values, especially if they don't change often. We we did we have done that ourselves on many of our role centers. You know these parts. Yep. Some of these numbers rarely change, like top 10 customer. I mean, it probably doesn't change between you sell, do some processing and you returning back to the role center, right? Yeah. So a lot of these we store in a table somewhere, cache it, um, and then we have some timestamp that says, when was this last update? And then we can say, okay, if it's a day old, then we'll make a new calculation. Yeah. and. Uh, Thank you for your answer. And I have another question regarding the system ID. Is it rare? Uh, can we write our own system ID? No. Again, no, no. a long debate. So you can insert. You cannot update it, but you can insert it. You can. Ah, uh, you can. Can you assign it yes. at insert time? Yes. Yeah. Even that has been debated. I would say, in length. <laughs> um, but once it's there, it's stable. That's why also in the yeah. chart called it immutable, meaning. Even if you change primary key, anything, it stays the same. You can delete the record and create a new one. Then it will get a new one. And you just answered that on insert, we can create our, we can insert our own uh, system ID. Would it be applicable for uh, API pages? If I can s do the post request with that I ID predefined? I I'm am not sure. Sure. Yeah, why not? I mean, often the reference comes from some other system. But the other part, though, I would say, is um, we need to ensure uh, uniqueness as one thing. Yep. <coughs> the other part is uh, we it's a GUID we are using, but we are indexing it as well, and it's actually expensive to index GUIDs. Mm, actually, uh, it's a sequential GUID. And that's why we are, thank you, that's why we're using what, what's called sequential GUIDs. They're not real GUIDs. They are GUIDs, but they are sequential. So they have a you know, beginning and then they grow over time, just like an uh, entry number would, meaning that maintaining the index becomes faster. Or thank you. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, that the last the No, t-shirt? No, yeah, but it's the last t-shirt. Maybe? Yeah, it's the last t shirt that I think this guy's on the front row also had a question. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, Could we get. Oh, he I have a question as well. No. Okay, there was also one, one no, guy here. I think you, have, you also have a question, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, regarding the system ID, 
Yeah. If I have a record, I can read the system ID and get the record by using <coughs> that system ID. Yes. But this function is not available while using record references. Is that uh, correct? correct? Well, the record ref has a function to get a field ID of a system ID. So I could use yeah, a field ref while you with a system ID field ID and then get the record. But I can't. No, no, yeah, yes, but the record ID also has a system ID field. We really want to make this a system ID, and not a regular field like anything else. Yes, it's stored in the SQL, obviously, but we want this to be accessed differently. So, so I can't, if I have a record reference, I can't get system ID of a record stored in that record reference. Also, variable type record reference. Yeah. Well, you know, you need. I mean, you need to know which table it is first, right? Yes, I guess. Yeah. So you need to know the table, and then you can do a record ref dot, whatever the command is, get from system ID. I can't remember. Yeah. But but you can get it by system ID. But but it's not like you can index your way over the fields and say field number seventeen or whatever is system ID. Okay. It is a system ID. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think we now, yeah, I can I get it because I think this gentleman on the front has been wave, waving his hand for a long time. Yeah. So Thank this you. probably um, also is the last question we can. Yeah, do. that's also the last question, I guess. Yeah, but we have this expert, ask expert. Oh yeah, so that's true. And ask any questions. Later yes. Also. So we, many of us will be around the booth with or without a beer in our hand, right? Yes. Um, is there plans to um, provide the ability to assign the service tier that a task schedule is running under? Not in that many, well, or you can already do it on-premise, right? Well, I can assign something to a task schedule, but I want to have that task run under a specific service tier. Uh, well, for loading purposes. No, I mean you can you can say that certain service tiers do not cannot run background tasks. Yes. And others can, right? right. In that sense, it will be routed. Yeah. But you it's cannot. The old category code which we lost. C the, correct. The, the, yeah. The, the queue. The job queue thing. Yeah, I'm. It's one of my babies. I'm willing to. <laughs> maybe we should have a talk over. Right. Uh, because there are many reasons uh, in in Azure. We, we move around machines, so we, we can't, we, we have no way of knowing whether this machine we're running right now is the same as we're running tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, they get reprovisioned and moved around all the time. Not all the time, but occasionally. The application is obviously on-prem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so when we change it from the old job queue functionality to the, use the new task scheduler thing, uh, we lost that capability, including the prioritization and and ha handling of categories, that still sucks a bit. I have to admit, but I'm maybe we could talk it okay. there okay. because we would like to get some input what we can do. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.